This video is sponsored by Opera. For the last eight years, I've been building, launching, and filming model rockets. I don't talk about the filming part much, but today I'd like to do just that. I build all the rockets I fly, but I often miss out on getting to watch the rockets I fly. I spend my time looking at a camera screen trying to keep the rocket in frame. For this first tip, thankfully, you don't have to do that. Here's how it works. You can do this with a point and shoot camera or your phone. We'll use the phone for this. You're gonna take your phone, hold it out in front of you and look at the rocket. Now look over to your phone and make sure you tilt it so that the rocket is centered on the screen and then look back at the rocket. When the rocket lifts off, you're going to keep your phone next to the rocket and tilt your head back as it goes up keeping the rocket right next to this edge on your phone. This will keep the rocket in frame and let you watch what's actually happening with your own eyes. I didn't center my shot too well here, but there are lots of other things you can do with a smartphone camera. Hello? No, no, I, I, I can't really talk right now. No, I, I just, I can't talk because this is not an actual phone that I use. This is one of my old phones and I keep all of my phones when I get a new one because they have great cameras. I'm going to put this kind of close to the pad. We're going to get a full shot, vertical shot of the rocket on the pad lifting off and we're going to do either 120 frames per second or 240. I also use these little gorilla pod things. These are awesome for the field because you don't really know exactly what position you want the phone in. You knew multiple orientations. Again, this is all like bargain barrel, whatever Amazon stuff is cheapest. Something you can do with phones to make the shot a little bit cooler, and this applies outside of phones, is you can get really close to the ground. So right now on the other side of the phone, the camera is in the top right. But if I take this, I turn it upside down, the phone will still recognize, it'll still shoot good video, but I'm getting the lens really close to the dirt. And so if any dirt blows by or blows back, we end up getting a much cooler, like bigger looking shot. We sort of elevate the perspective of the rocket. Phones can also be mounted to the launch pad or the launch rail, and you can use that slow motion ability to get an intense liftoff shot. I like to mount things to the launch pad using one of these long bendy arms, and if you do this, the phone or camera on the end will shake, which can evoke more intensity from the shot. Think of the iconic liftoff imagery from the Saturn V. Some of those best shots are shaky. They rattle and vibrate in that extreme environment, and you can capture some of that vibe with a loosely mounted phone on a launch rail. Now, speaking of shots from the launch rail, if you don't want to put your phone at risk by mounting it all the way up there, you can do it with a GoPro, which is a lot more hardy. These types of down-looking or up-looking shots on the rail are also a great opportunity to get footage of you loading the rocket on the rail and raising it vertical, which can look pretty cool. Here's some footage of me loading Avalanche onto the launch rail and raising it vertical, and then a little bit of footage of me raising the Send It rail vertical. Because this GoPro is higher up, you can either access it wirelessly with your phone to trigger recording, or you can put an extra battery up top, but otherwise the GoPro might die. Sometimes these launches take a while. So these GoPros can go more places than on a launch rail, but before we talk about that, I 
want to talk about buying GoPros. So these are GoPro Hero 6 Black cameras. They're the GoPros I use. I got them a couple years ago, but they're five years old. And I recommend buying your GoPros used if you can. If you look this stuff up, I mean, these are cameras that used to go for 400 or 500 new, and now they're going for 140, 69, 20. I mean, I, I don't know if I would trust the $20 one. But you can get great deals here on used cameras that are a couple generations old. And again, if you're putting them in front of rockets or behind rockets, they're probably gonna get damaged. Buy them used. By the way, I've painted all my GoPros white and then just wiped off the critical parts. This really helps keep the GoPros a little bit cooler in the hot sun. So these things can be placed all over the ground, pointing at the rocket. Generally, I find these shots to be less compelling than the up-close shots with an action camera. You wanna fill the frame with what's happening. And with a GoPro, if you put it far away, it's a little less compelling. That said, they can be nice for pulling a thumbnail out if you wanna make a YouTube video, and they're kinda nice to have for context. Generally though, it's going to be the same rule as that smartphone camera, which is get that lens as close to the dirt as you can. Elevate the rocket in the shot. With these GoPro shots, you'll find the ones that look best are the ones that stay close to the ground and keep the rocket elevated in the frame. The rocket should be against the sky. Some of these turn out better than others. Of course, if you put a GoPro next to an S motor, the S motor is not that nice to the GoPro. This is a shot from Evolution Space's Gold Chain Cowboy mission in the spring. I put a GoPro on the ground and, uh... One, launch. The GoPro survived just fine. It still shoots great footage. It's just that that front element on the lens cracked. Right here is a shot from Xyla's Spite launch over the summer. I think this is a good example of a nice shot. We've got the rocket covering about a third of the frame vertical wise. We've got a bunch of sparks and dirt that fly back at the rocket and it's made more intense because we've got that lens close to the ground. Here is an example of a shot that I do not find compelling and that goes against the rules I've said. Uh, we set the shot up by accident for the first EBDB flight and you can see right off the bat, the rocket is far away in the frame, so we're not filling the frame. We're not putting the rocket against the sky. The camera is not low to the ground. There's some junk in the frame and the whole frame is like tilted at a few degrees. Not very compelling. Before we move on from GoPros, I wanna talk a little bit about color correction. The factory settings for most GoPros are gonna make it look great. And if you want simplicity, just leave it the way it is, change your resolution and frame rate and you're good to go. For instance, this is shot with a GoPro Hero 8 with mostly factory settings. Both of these shots come from my friend, Andrew Adams, who turns out to be really good at setting GoPros in places that end up becoming thumbnails. But in contrast to that, pun intended, you can also shoot in a low contrast mode with GoPros. I think they call it ProTune, and this will give you more room to tweak things in post-production if you wanna have a lot of control. Here's a shot from a launch that I did with Send It about a year ago. Right off the bat, this shot is not doing anything for me. You can see the fisheye effect, the image is crooked, it's a little too far out, there's low contrast and low saturation. I don't think anyone's getting out of bed for this shot. Is that a saying? I, I don't know, man. <laughs> Sometimes I just be saying stuff. I'll show you how to make some corrections here, and these settings are gonna apply in any video editor, although I'm in Adobe Premiere right now. First, I'll come over to scale, and we'll change that to 110%, so we're gonna zoom in just a little bit. And I'm noticing that the image is tilted, so we'll tilt it over, negative one degree, and that will straighten things out a bit. The next thing I'm noticing is all of this fisheye effect. You can see it in the long pole here. You can see it across the horizon. It's all bendy. So we'll come over here, type in lens distortion, and and when we take that effect, put it on, we can adjust the curvature of this lens. I find that for GoPros, somewhere around mid 20s like this will flatten out your horizon and sort of correct the image that comes out of it. One of the last things to do here is add a little bit of color correction. So we'll take this really flat image. I'll add the Lumetri color plugin. The first thing I'm noticing, everything is very bright here. So we'll start by pulling down the shadows a little bit. So this is the darker parts of the image. And you can see now we've got a more, a more punchy look here. Vibrance and saturation are something that are fun to play with, although you don't want to go too hard so you make it look like Candyland. I find that a bump between between 110 and 120 percent are usually kind of fun. And just with those two settings, we've turned this flat image into this much more colorful, punchy image. I'm not gonna get into color correction. It's a whole bag of worms, so let's just move on. I don't think bag of worms is a saying either. I think it's a can of worms and a bag of, bag of eggs. I don't know, man. There's a reason I do rockets and not for sayings. <laughs> The 
strength of a UAV shot is not that it's up high, it's that it's up high and that it can move. These shots are all from a UAV, but they're all static. They don't move, they just hold their position. But when you add a little bit of motion to that shot, you literally add a third dimension to the shot. You've got a largely two-dimensional image, and if you move around, you can create that third dimension. I have a DJI Phantom 4, but with most UAVs, you'll find a point of interest mode, or maybe called a circle mode. With that, you can hover over the launch pad, set those coordinates as your center, then back the drone up, tilt the camera where you want it, and start the program. This program will make the UAV circle around the launch pad, giving you that little bit of motion to add depth to the shot. And because it's automatic, you can let it circle like that on its own, and then focus on getting other shots or just watching the rocket itself. The last thing I want to say about UAVs is that the only type of motion I would try to avoid is the gimbal up or down motion. With most UAVs, you'll have the ability to tilt this camera up or down, and it is really hard to do that fast and accurately for a rocket launch. Unless you're filming a rocket with a very slow liftoff, getting that motion synced between the drone and the rocket is going to be difficult. Now, let's say you do want a panning up shot. You want a shot from above where you look down at the rocket and then it pans up as the rocket lifts off. There are a few ways to do this. For instance, you could build a rig that swings a camera up as the rocket lifts off. This is a thing that has been done. The shots are very compelling. It's really cool to see these. But a cheaper, simpler, and not quite as good way to achieve this shot is to do it with a 360 camera. You can take one of these bad boys, mount it on top of a pole right next to the launch pad. Then you just let it film the launch like any other camera. You can take it into the 360 editor app, keyframe the shot, and then make it look like it's tracking the liftoff. Speaking of tracking shots, if you want to get a better tracking shot than just using your phone and moving it up with your hand, you can use a tripod, but there's a specific type of tripod that you want for this, and it's called a fluid head tripod. A normal tripod is going to have plastic bearings or even metal bearings, but they might not move incredibly smoothly. And a fluid head tripod is going to be filled with oil in those bearings and joints so that when you move the tripod up or down, left or right, it's going to be a much smoother movement. They're used in the cinema industry quite a bit. For tracking rockets, I like to shoot at 4K resolution, 120 frames per second, and slightly underexposed. I shoot my tracking shots and what you're watching right now on a Zcam E2. This is also what Tim Dodd the everyday astronaut uses for a lot of his cameras. They're great cameras, but they're probably not entry-level cameras. The good news is that a lot of mirrorless cameras that are out right now, a lot of the Sony A7 series can shoot with those settings. Now, I like using 4K and 120 frames per second because it looks very good, but it also helps from a technical perspective. You'll notice that for some of my setup shots, I zoom in fairly close. I like getting the camera close to the ground and zoom in with a long lens. But for the raw tracking shot, I'm fairly zoomed out for the launch. For most high-powered rockets, keeping the shot wide means you're less likely to let the rocket go out of frame when it jumps off the pad, and this is particularly helpful when you want to stabilize the footage in post-production. Oftentimes, I'll bring my footage into Adobe After Effects and track the motion of the rocket, then stabilize around it to get a better sense of how the rocket moves during flight. This is a tedious process, but it's made much easier by shooting at 4K and 120 frames per second. And one last thing before we move on, this is not in the script, but I just remembered it. Autofocus is not your friend for tracking shots. Set your focus to manual, set it to infinity, and don't change it. I've had autofocus lose track when I do tracking shots. I know friends who have had it happen. If you've had it happen, put it in the comments. You'll see plenty of people who have had this happen to them. If you're pointing your camera at the sky, turn your autofocus off. So far, I have only shot with the Freefly Wave camera, so that's the only one I can really speak on here, but it's worked quite well for me. And the only thing I'll say before we look at the footage is that I think a high-speed camera is the only camera you should never buy. Conveniently, that's fairly easy to do since they're so expensive, but I would try to only get them on loan or through a rental program. I would not buy one. My reasoning behind this is one, they're specialty cameras. They're only used for certain types of shots, and unless you're doing engineering that requires high-speed footage very 
very consistently, it's probably not worth it. And two, the technology behind high-speed cameras is going to improve so much every five to eight to 10 years that you will depreciate really, really fast by buying one of the cameras. Howdy, folks. You are just about where I want to put this camera. And this is a good segue here. Uh, because it is not my camera, I shoot high-speed footage with a pretty long lens. You want to keep that camera away from the rocket. So that's all I've got for you for cameras on the ground. I would like to do a video on onboard cameras. I've got a couple here, a Runcam Hybrid, a Runcam Split 4, a Runcam 2. This is a lens for a GoPro. This is a Go 3. This is a GoPro Hero 10, I think. There's all sorts of ways to do onboard footage, and I think they just require an entirely separate video for that. So if you want to see that type of video covered, I'm probably gonna do it anyway, but go ahead and leave it in the comments. And before we wrap this shindig up, it's time for a word from the sponsor for today's video. Thanks to Opera for sponsoring this video. If you don't know already, Opera Desktop is a web browser built to improve productivity and make life easier. It also includes a free VPN and ad blocker, both of those things I use basically all the time. Opera One is the latest version of their browser with an entirely redesigned look and new features like tab islands. Let me ask you a question. Are you like me? Do you open 30 billion tabs and then go, I'll get to those later? Let's say you are like me, so you're on NASA's technical report server and you've got a bunch of tabs open about fin guidance and control. On a normal browser, keeping tabs on all those tabs, pun intended, is gonna be a mess to navigate. But with Opera, I love that the browser will automatically group these into a tab island and I can collapse them to stay more organized. Opera One also includes access to Aria, which is a native in-browser AI. You can interact with it directly or use Aria's prompts when you highlight text to help you better understand something. It's also a user-controlled experience, which means that you can opt in to using it or opt out if you don't want to. Opera One is totally free to use and you can try it by using my link in the description down below. Thank you so much to Opera for sponsoring today's video. Thanks to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.